Hi, Hamo. Yeah, muted. I said, now I understand why you're looking up like this. <laughs> okay. I will move you down to my level. There we go. <laughs> All righty. Hello, everybody. Hi, Wayne. How are you? Doing good. How are you doing? I feeling a little better today? Yeah. Um, the the hay fever has gone away. I hardly ever get hay fever anymore because we filled our house with air purifiers, which do a mm. great job. But something got past them yesterday, and I just ah. So now I feel like a bit flat after a day of feeling bad. You know, the next day you're kind of like yeah. But yeah. you know, APL will cheer me up in the company of you folks. Which helps, <laughs> you know. Do you have any recommendations on air purifiers? I know there's like the Dyson formaldehyde ones and Molecule and all this kind of stuff, but I haven't seen anyone oh recommend God, any. Do I? Of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> Pray to tell. I'm all about air quality. Um, so there's uh, basically, if you Google for like, uh, let me try to think. Uh, oh yeah, CADR calculator. Um, that tells you the clean air delivery rate that you'll need, um, uh, basically to get a certain number of air changes per hour, which is ACH. Um, and like if you aim for, I don't know, like um, five to eight air changes per hour as being pretty good, then you just type in your room size into one of those online CADR calculators, clean air delivery rate calculators, and it'll tell you what CADR you need. Uh, so that is just a case of buying an air purifier that has that CADR and, uh, and a HIPAA HEPA filter. It's like, it couldn't be less high tech. It's literally like a piece of woven cloth, which with a fan that blows air through it. That's what an air purifier is. So I got this thing called the the Yuhu. Uh, it's like a sensor because I was interested to know air quality, and I discovered the uh, CO two was way too high just because closed windows and things. Um, oh god! Yeah. And so definitely that's easy, right? You have to ventilate. There's no solution other than scrubbing. Yeah. So um, you need a you need yeah. So I um I had I I went through that last year or the year before with the wildfires in California, um and we had to close up all the windows and everything and. Um, you know, in the process I was worried about like, oh, is that going to be bad? And I bought a CO2 monitor and I discovered our CO2 was like 1800, you know, when the maximum recommended is like 800. <laughs> like pass out. Um, yeah, you get headaches and you feel like an idiot. And um, so ever since then, I've been pretty careful about CO2. You know, that, that's separate, of course, you know, you can have perfectly good CO2, but still bad air quality if there's so one thing that I have is uh, quite high TVOX that are unpredictable. Like, so yeah. I don't know if it's the sensor. Just one moment, hang on, to figure out. Sorry. That's okay. I was just going to say, I don't know if anyone has any experience with that because I haven't been able to figure it out. I've been collecting data for months now and I can't really figure out any clear correlation with the TVOX. Um, but they they sometimes are quite high, and I suspect it affects you know sleep and things like that. So yeah. I do know there's some uh, sensors on the market. So I just don't know if that's something you already looked into or you know. Yeah, I mean I've got air purifiers which have gas and particle sensors on them, um, and so then they have an auto mode where they'll go go harder if there's more stuff. I don't find they seem to correlate with my hay fever though, honestly. So my method of setting the fan level as if I start getting hay fever or turn it up. Uh, okay. I don't find the auto seems to work that well for me. But, um, okay, but yeah, that, that's definitely been a life changer for me is getting clean air in my house. That's basically the first bad hay fever I've had in like 18 months. And it used to, you know, be like the single biggest impact I reckon on my quality of life was feeling crap all the time. Um, anywho, that's a bit of a aside, interesting aside, nonetheless. Um, any interesting uh, APL 
discoveries since yesterday or questions or anything else? Not really, it's fine. It's, it's yeah. remarkably hard to do simple things. Yeah, well, I mean, we just started, right? So that's, yeah. Posted Shockingly hard so. to load. Oh, God, Felix. How's that? Uh, I posted. I posted in the forums a basic kind of genetic algorithm, uh, which was pretty cool. But uh... I saw that. I think I think basic is a is is not a fair description. I mean, compared to where at least I'm up to, it looks pretty sophisticated. Yeah, I feel like there's a a lot that can be done to. transform it into a more kind of array based solution than uh-huh well that'll be an interesting project for read. us all to try to help with i think yeah i mean we're not close to knowing all the glyphs that you're using yet um but i think we've got some catching up to do my okay. my goal my goal is to implement connect four i've implemented it in so many languages and it seems oh, nice. a good and good enough problem that is non-trivial yeah so like but, with an AI that you play against? Yeah, 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 just cool. mi minimax okay. kind of uh, implementation. There's a good uh, Kaggle com competition on that one going on since well, a while, which is fun. Then we could try slotting in a genetic algorithm to um, try to optimize it as well. That'd be cool. Yes, but but just like the simple, the board and simple yeah. how to best represent the array of the board is already hard. I yeah, think. I'm not even at a point of thinking about doing anything yet. Um, oh, I just pressed the wrong button. Um, I just had a question from like, tried this to... topic about, oh, sorry. Do you want to go? Oh, I, I was just going to say, I, was, I, I spent um, a, a lot of time the last day trying to figure out how to load images into APL just to get the pixel values. And uh, it, was, it was a lot harder. No, okay. um, no, and I asked on the Discord uh, if there was any kind of beginner-friendly um, ways to load it, and I got a lot of resources that I had no luck deciphering. Um, <laughs> was so, that on the Was that on the APL Discord? I, yeah. I saw the dialogue conference that they're having coming up. That this is a hot topic that they're going to discuss. Image processing. Yeah. Oh. Awesome. I wanted to ask, uh, we'd be talking a lot about complex numbers, which are super cool. Um, I noticed they're supported in, in Torch, in PyTorch. Is it, is it like deep learning uses mm -hmm. for? Oh, yes. Like, what, what is Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, apart from anything else, they're, a, they're an input format for, you know, for audio, for example, we would often represent as kind of magnitude and phase. Um, and we don't normally have to worry about it, but you can um, optimize convolutions using Fourier transforms, you know, and using complex representation. Um, that's kind of handled for us by QDNN nowadays. But uh, yeah, you know, inputs and outputs as complex numbers is certainly a thing. And 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 also, if you've got layers that represent kind of more like you know, the activations you hope might kind of represent some something from your domain. They might, you know, be represented well as complex numbers. You might have loss functions based on that or... Cool. Yeah. But the only time I've used them in PyTorch is for audio, but I know other folks use them for other things. Um, I also saw that... Um, Adam, who actually works at Dialog, and I think he's the guy in Arraycast who said he's like used APO his whole life, uh, answered some of our questions. Um, okay, so once, okay, so if you use, I'm, I'm on Mac, not on Windows, but on Windows, once you've removed some docked windows, you can click session save. You can right click on the language bar and hide caption. Once you've got boxing on, you can save your session. And yes, I've already saw in the forum to get backticks with the in-browser backtick space. So that was 
good to get Adam to answer some of our questions. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, Yeah. Um, Wasim did some really nice notes, which I finally got a note around to reading. Um, and so I, yeah, I actually highly recommend them. So they're linked from the Lesson One forum. So thanks for doing that, Wasim. Am I pronouncing your name right? Yep. Cool. Where's, Pleasure. um? what's, what, what, where is the, that name from? You're in South Africa, right? So funny enough, I'm in Sydney at the moment. No way. My parents, but I'm originally from South Africa. Uh -huh. um, and the name is Arabic. Uh-huh. Cool. Welcome to Australia. <laughs> better, better time zone for you. How long are yeah. you here for? Uh, until end of next month, actually. It's a nice long time. Great. Yeah. Um, if you say hi in the forum, if you want to meet up with any uh, fast AI people, I'm sure there's, I know there's a bunch of people in in Sydney. Uh, yeah, these are great notes. Thank you so much. I love that you've got the juggling notation. Had you come across juggling notation before we discussed it? No, not at all. It's interesting, isn't it? It's like mm -hmm. it was um, game changing, apparently. And uh, Aaron Hughes, PhD, or she, I don't know how you pronounce his name. Um, Serata, you might know. Do you know how you pronounce this? I guess this is a Chinese name. It's, I mean, I know it's not Pinyin, but it's uh... no, you don't know. Okay. I thought um, for APL today. Um... Oh, good. There's a link here. Some thank you. By the way, um, for those of you who hadn't noticed, um, at least when I remember or when Serata reminds me, I um, click on the make a wiki, which means that anybody can click edit on these posts. Um, and so thank you for those of you who have been adding stuff to them. Um, I was thinking like in terms of stuff that's gonna help us uh, understand more of the documentation and do more things. I think there's two main things I wanted to cover today, which is left arrow and row. Um, and basically, do they call it left arrow? They do. Okay, cool. So left arrow, which is a left square bracket, is used to assign names to variables. Um, so a is three. Um, so obviously, in a lot of languages, we would use equals for that. Um, but, you know, a statement like x equals x plus one is not a mathematically same statement. Um, so I'm glad APL does not use equals to mean that. So in other languages, we have to say equals equals to mean that. Um, and I know this is something, you know, the kids I teach found quite confusing we're doing when we're doing Python this like it's a very strange meaning of equals. Um, so you can absolutely do that. You know, if you've got something called x, you can rebind it to its previous value plus one. Um, I mean, let's try it. A plus one. Okay. Um, and if you uh, if you add a, a a plus sign before that a you the a plus a arrow a plus one it'll actually um, print it out for you mm. as well cool. just, just to save your line i mean that makes sense doesn't it right because we learned that um, monadic plus is um conjugate now that won't work for a uh complex number because it will actually give you the conjugate but yeah this is going to return the conjugate of everything to the right um, so assignment is returning its the assigned value and then taking the conjugate of it will, as a result, print it out. Um, I think I think this might be better, left tech. Um, that's because that's actually always monadic function same. 
So if I replace this with that. And I think you can also, when you start nesting these assignments, because these assignments can be, you could create a new variable as part of, you can create mm -hmm. A is uh, left arrow, B is left arrow, B plus one, A plus yes. one. So you can, yes. you can actually nest them. Yes. And I think if you do left arrow and then the box, I forget what it's called, an assignment yes. to the box. I think it's um, called quad. It is you... quad, which is, is that an L there? That tick L? Let's yes. Try. Yeah. So I think if you so assign kind of... to that. That's what they do in the docs kind of usually. New... The mnemonic is you're kind of like saving to the screen. Ah. Uh, got it. So that's a special thing to assign to. Yeah, a All lot right. of the I.O. operations uh, are handled by Quad. Uh-huh. Great. Now, the other interesting thing which is happening um, is that Isaac has started creating a website for the study group. Um, which is not quite up and running yet. Let's pop this um, on the other did you do the settings pages? Set the GitHub pages, the GitHub pages branch and all that? Um, I th yeah, I think we can just probably do that now. So let me... Um, while I remember to get poll. And then, yeah, we should be. So for those of you that don't know, GitHub has a very nice uh, feature called GitHub Pages, which basically turns a repo into a website. Um, and to use it, um, you basically go to Pages. And you say source is this branch. And in theory, I should now be able to click on this. Uh, we may need to, oops. So I can check what's going on by switching to that branch. Okay, so there's definitely something there. I had to do a little, uh, after I set, did the settings and pages, I had to make a small commit to tell yeah. publish the first time. I've noticed that too. Okay, I'll remove one carriage return from here. And... Um, I can I vaguely hear... Uh, Hamill, are you talking? I can vaguely hear your... Just ghostly distant voice. Can you hear me now? Oh, there you are. Uh, that sounds great. Yeah, it's it's uh, the site is up actually. It's ready. Uh, okay. Fastai.github.io slash APL study. Something I like to do is when I go here is I copy this and then I go into settings and paste it here. And that way, anybody on my page, including me, and jump to the website. I really wish they did that automatically. Yeah. Look at that. Okay. Thank you, Isaac. This is beautiful. There it all is. Huh. So, oh, this is cool. I didn't notice the, this thing here automatically pops open the so this is Quarto, which is what NBDev2 will be using, which is full of neat tricks. Tags, so fancy. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of Quarto's commands are uh, really well designed. Yeah, it really is. It's from R Studio, JJ Yale's company, and everything he's done has been great. He's hired a lot of great people as well. And he's been super helpful. I think we need some image of some APO thing. That'd be nice. 
It's a very cool image there. All right, well, that was easy. Yeah, all um, the images are the Quarto defaults, so. I see. Well, if anybody <laughs> wants to do a PR, good. which uploads an image of, I don't know, a cool formula or picture of Isaac with a little lambda on his head or whatever, you know, it'll all be good. So the way, um, yeah, so the way this works is, um, um, as I say, basically, the way I like to do it, and, and it works pretty easily, is if you have a branch called GH Pages, then any HTML, et cetera, in that branch just ends up as your website. So here's index.html, and that's the website. Um, and now the way that's being created is there's a thing called um, GitHub Actions, which is basically something that will automatically run some code for you when you do things on GitHub. Uh, the YAML files, of course, because all the cool kids use YAML files. Um, and so you say, okay, well, when should this run? And oh, it's going to run when you push to master. Um, okay, what happens when you push to master? Well, it's going to run a job called deploy, uh, which will run on Ubuntu. So they've got like every major OS with lots of releases, which will check out this repo, set up Python, run this script, run this command, and then run this action, which is deploy to GitHub pages. Um, and I'm guessing, Isaac, you basically borrowed this from um, NB process. It looks similar. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I took this from your FastCaggle repository and oh, there's some minor changes, but roughly the same. Yeah, so FastCaggle, I just I just did NB process new. NB process is the current name of what will be NB Dev 2, hopefully within three weeks or so. Um, and as you might have noticed, one nice thing about this is that, um, you know, we have a um, Uh, why is this in a separate um, folder, by the way, Isaac? Was that necessary for some reason, or? I don't think so. That was the that was how it the uh, the default create uh, website Porto function did, and I didn't I change see. structure. Anyway, but so I we've think got we a, could flatten yeah. it. Yeah, so we've got a notebook here, um, and that notebook has been auto converted into a post, which is nice. So once you've got this set up. Um, you can start authoring technical blog posts with notebooks really easily, particularly because if you hit dot, um, why is it not working? I thought if you hit dot, yeah, it's meant to be dot, never mind. Um, you can open up the notebook in github.dev, which is basically a slimmed down online version of VS Code. And so I can start editing straight away. Um, I assume that they won't have the uh, APL kernel installed, but um, I'm not sure. You can't, I'm not sure you can even run Python, can you? Um, but you can certainly edit the the Markdown and move cells around and stuff. Um, or you can just put Markdown files in there. All right, so um, let's in fact, let's go ahead and make this a bit simpler while we're here. Otherwise, I might go a bit crazy. Um, so Uh, all right. So if we move all that into the parent, um, then we should be able to remove that. Ah, uh, yes, okay. Well, we can add this to this.gitignore. So gitignore 
um, is the file which contains a list of all the things that won't that that get will by default ignore. Um, so dot quarto, and if you end it up with a, if you end with a slash, it means it's a directory. Okay. Um, All right. Move all that. Okay, so we should also add dot ipy and v checkpoints to our get ignore. Um, and so then let's check. So then underscore quarto dot yaml is where it's kind of defined. Uh, so this doesn't need to be dot dot slash anymore. Can you think of anything else I might need to change off the top of your head, um, Isaac? Um. Thank you. I think you got everything. What does freeze do? Is that different to execute false? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. It came, that was a default setting. Uh, let me uh -huh. check. I see. Um, all right. So git status will tell us how we're doing here. Oh, yeah. And I was going to add .ipy and b checkpoints dot i pi n b check points. okay so i think that is that means it's not going to um re-render or rerun um file unless uh -huh. the unless it's changed okay makes sense all right so we've renamed some things we've deleted one thing we've modified one thing that sounds good Oh, I haven't got this set up yet. That's fine. All right. So git commit minus am. So a will add everything that's not yet added. And m means I'm going to put a message right here. I thought I'd already done that. Oh, I, that's right. I added that one carriage return. Great. And so now we should be able to go to fastai.github.io slash APL study. And it's still working. How about that? And so something that's useful to know is um, your GitHub Actions, when they run, oh, didn't work. They get logged here. And so when it breaks, you get a cross. Oh, OK, Quarto Render is going to have oh, to change. Gotcha. So that's just no, that's not going to need anything anymore. So we'll change our, oh, mm -hmm. I mean, so uh, you know, just something else to show you. We don't have to like switch to the terminal. We can just go to GitHub workflows and click on here and click on edit and just edit it directly if we want to. And that by default uses the current directory, I believe. We can just go ahead and commit that. And I don't know where we have architecture here. I think it defaults to x64, doesn't it, Hamill? Yes. Yeah, you don't need that. Cool. And then oh, something else you don't need is this pipe is used in YAML to do a multi-line thing. And since we only have one line here, we don't need that either. 
Gotcha. But, but your screen is has so much vertical space now. <laughs> but it's split in half, Camel, <laughs> so it doesn't really. <laughs> so I still have reason to complain about vertical space. Besides which, that's an important part of my personality. All right, so that worked. That's good. And so after it updates, then the GitHub Pages bot will actually put that up on our website. OK. So um, ah, great. So this, um, this is called a raw cell, um, which uh, Isaac's created for us. And you can create a raw cell by pressing R during this menu. Um, and things that are between three dashes are called YAML front matter. YAML is yet another markup language. And basically, this is a bunch of key value things um, um, in YAML. Um, and yeah, this is where we basically put the information we want. The title's actually not needed because it'll pick it up automatically from an H1. Or to put it another way, the H1 is needed because it will come automatically from the title. Um, great. I suppose I should put my name here since I'm writing it at the moment. Um, and all right. Um, Something I find really helpful is I use this um, thing called uh, collapsible headings. And so I just hit control shift left and which, as you can see, it closes everything up. Um, and then you can basically press right arrow to jump to the end of a section or to open a section. So that's left, right. And if you're already at the start of the section, you press left again, it'll close it up. Um, I find it really helpful for zipping around quickly. As you can see. All right, so we started talking about precedence yesterday. Um, yeah, I don't think there's too much more to say about precedence. Um, maybe we'll create a section called like expressions, of which part of that is about precedence. And then the other thing we put in here is about functions. OK. Um, so in Python, or indeed in math, in math, you would write a function like this. You'd say f of x is, you know, whatever, um, 2x, say. Uh, or in Python, you would say define a function which takes x and it returns 2 times x. Or you could create a lambda in function. f is a function which takes x and returns 2x. So these are all ways you can define functions in math, or these two are two ways you can define functions in um, Python. Um, they all have something in common, which is that you're telling you're telling the reader in the case of math and the interpreter in the case of Python, what's the name of the thing that you're passing in? And you could pass in more than one thing. Right? Um, APL is different. Um, APL has decided for you what names you're going to call things. Um, so to create a function in APL, um, it's just assigning something to a symbol. Right, so rather than saying, um, oh, I've got to turn my APL thingy on, uh, which means I need to turn on my bookmark bar, which I thought I need a shortcut key to, but I don't. Shift Command B. Let's try that again. Command Shift B. Oh, there we go. APL. All right, F. So we can assign. Um, a scalar or a list or the result of an expression with possibly various other functions in, right, whatever. Or we can assign a function. 
And to create a function in APL, um, you use curly brackets. So curly brackets means this is a function. And then inside the function, you say what you want to do, and you don't have to name the parameters. Uh, they already have names. Uh, if you have one parameter, it's going to get called omega, which is w. So here's a times two function. And to pass the one parameter, you just chuck it on the right. OK. Um, what if you want to create a function called g, which does something times two plus something else? Uh, then a second parameter will always be called alpha. Now, the second parameter goes on the left. So this will be, this becomes omega, so it'll be 4 times 2, which is 8, plus 3 is 11. Uh, that's not right. Uh, oh, sorry, it's going to be this, sorry, this Precedence. will happen first. Yep, yep, thank you. So it'll be 2 plus 3 is 5, times 4 is 20. Okay, great. As you can see, I'm still not thinking APL yet. Um, that's, I think, all there is to know about functions at this stage until we get to operators. Um, actually, we should do operators first, maybe. Do we? No, let's not. I think that's enough. So, um, but what happens if we have more than two variables? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> you can have zero, uh, one, or two. Um, I guess, like, basically, I have a feeling it can do unpacking. It can. You can do some pattern matching. Yeah, so you could pass a list and then unpack it. Or destructuring, as I think some people call it. Uh, I guess we should keep that here because that's actually quite interesting. Can you pass in the the function above as into the equation of the function? Um, can you pass the function above? What do you mean? Can you put the f inside the g function? Oh yeah, absolutely. F and g are now like just the same as plus, minus, whatever. They're just APL functions that you can do whatever with. So yeah, so we could um, um, h is equal to 2 plus f of omega. Yeah, so it's something that I like, right? Because all the APL glyphs, at least the ones that are functions, um, are either unary, monadic, or binary, dyadic. And they always, you know, if they're monadic, the thing goes on the right. And if they're dyadic, then they're infix. And the functions you create are exactly the same. And you can create Unicode function names if you want to. So you can like create your own very APL-ish looking functions if you wish. Destructuring assignment. OK. So uh, when we use the word array, we're using it to mean the same thing that NumPy calls arrays and that PyTorch calls tensors. So they're, um, you know, rect you know, n-dimensional, regularly shaped bunches of things. Um, 
and um, in in PyTorch, we call the the rank of a tensor the number of dimensions that it has. So a vector would be one dimensional. And the matrix would be two dimensional. A scalar would be zero dimensional. Um, so it'd be helpful to know how to create things. So we know how to create scalars. Um, you just type them in. We know how to create vectors. So rank one arrays, you type in with spaces. Um, so something that's going to be helpful in explaining this will actually, first of all, be to learn about IOTA. You can also, as an earlier step, you might be, um, if you wanted to teach the row, you could, you can actually use the row to reshape and yeah. give it a one or a zero to broadcast it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. Yeah, let's do it that way. Thanks. Um, um, oh, or we can just type it in. Let's just type it in. So let's just create something. And let's use our trick now that we've learned it. Okay. So display a list we assigned to A. Um, and we're going to have to do this backwards, but I think that's fine. Uh, dyadic first. So let's look it up. Oh, hold on, row, here it is. And we are going to get to learn a song today. That's the good news. In fact, we're starting to see some of the song here. That's cool. Um, I guess we should mention strings, actually, because they do use them in the documentation a lot. I don't know what they call numbers and strings and arrays. What's the term for those things, things that aren't functions? I got to call them basic objects for now, but if anybody learns what they're actually meant to be called, let me know. In the box, they say it's a language element. Is it supposed to call all this symbol well, is el yeah. element? Yeah, that's, that's right. But I'm trying to talk about things that aren't those. I'm trying to talk about numbers, arrays, and strings which um, is none of these things. Like, anyway, we'll figure it out. Um, so, strings. Um, I'm not sure there's much more to say about strings. What does the language reference say if I search for string? I'm not quite sure what order they think they're showing this in, but it's definitely not the most helpful one. <laughs> um, I see, they don't call them strings. Maybe this is considered a list of characters. I suspect it is actually. I found another blog post that calls them character vectors and scalars. Oh, right, because I think this array. is different, right? Um, okay, so we're about to get slightly ahead of ourselves, but this tells us the shape. Okay, so that's weird, right? So um, I don't think we should do strings yet until we do row, because they don't make sense until we can look at shapes.
Okay. Um, all right, so we've got, oopsie daisy, a list. Um, so we, we can turn that into a matrix using dyadic row. which is called reshape. Okay, this is just called row. Figure out what I did with my heading levels here. So that's two. Oh yeah, that's three. Okay, that's four. Great. Um, so that's reshape. Um, and so that is, I think, is that the same as what NumPy calls it? Reshape? Yes. Same as NumPy's reshape. So it gives a new shape to an array. So the shape of an array is basically like how many columns and rows and whatever does it have. So if we want to do three rows of two columns, we can reshape our array, as you see. One and, thing that threw me off, oh, go ahead. Um, I was just gonna say at this point, like, or maybe at the very top of this, we should um, say, Boxing style equals max. Did I do that? I'll stop boxing on style equals max. I think it was style uh, dash max, I think. Dash or style dash equals style max. max. Yeah, actually I can see it in the background there. Okay, great. So there we go. What is it doing? It's slow. Okay. Um, okay. So I think uh, Isaac wrote something on the forum about this. Um, so anywhere you see an arrow, that means this is like a dimension that exists, right? There's no arrow here. So this is considered like infinitely thin. So think of this as a vector, not as a one height you know, as a matrix with one row, this is a vector. Um, I, was, I was talking to my daughter about this yesterday and she found this very confusing. She's like, well, it does have height. It's gonna say like, okay, it does on the screen, but this is a representation on the screen of an abstract mathematical prop, uh, object that doesn't have height. And it's just that if I drew it the infinitely thin, you know, it's like Claire, you wouldn't be able to read it and you would think that wasn't very helpful, which she agreed was true. Um, Whereas this thing here has two arrows, this actually has three rows and two columns. And then the squiggle means that it's got numbers in. Um, there's two other options. It could have a mixture of things with some strings and stuff in, or it could even have other arrays in. Um, they would get different symbols. Um, so I think perhaps one of the more interesting ones to look at is what happens if we have one row with six. And so now it does not look the same, right? No arrow, arrow. So this is a matrix. Uh, so the shape is whatever is on whatever you would put on the left hand side to create that thing. I assume it's going to be called shape, but I suppose I should check. Shape of, okay. Shape of. Um, so for example, let's call this matrix okay, and so if we then get um 
the shape of A. It's um, a single dimension of length six, whereas the shape of matri matrix is two rows by three columns. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, I may have missed this. Uh, what does the writing to the box thing do again? It's just printing it in a more nice way for us. So everything no, we... uh, what I mean is... Um... Oh, writing to the box. Uh, that prints it out on the screen. So it Isn't assigns it to on matrix the and then anyway? prints it on the screen. No, it doesn't. If I remove it, because I'm assigning, it doesn't display it. Oh, because you're assigning. Okay, got it. Sorry. Yep, yep, yep. So you're just kind of yeah. adding, chaining the assignment to assign it to the screen as well. And this box is that is itself a function, quad. like. Yeah, that that's a but that's a function called quad, um, which I think does a lot of things. Um, I think this is squad. Is the same thing as quad? Oh, um, never mind. It's a good question. I don't know. I didn't think so. No, squad is used for indexing. OK, so maybe quad is like not a language element, then. It's some weird special thing. What if I search for it? Here we are. It's a variable which communicates between the user's terminal and APL. Depends on whether it's been assigned or referenced. When it's assigned, the array is displayed. OK, so it's a special magic variable. Thanks, one thing about helpful. these, uh, one thing on these creating and reshaping uh, matrices that uh, cause some confusion for me because I, I didn't realize I had a bug is you can actually reshape to any size. So if you have four numbers and you reshape it to a three by three, it'll just loop through. It'll use the first your four numbers plus the first two in the array to make six. And so it can broadcast in, in kind of weird ways. Um sorry I just wondering did we We've got something here called functions and assignment, but I don't actually see if we ever did normal assignment. Because that would I don't be the think right we place. did. Oh, okay. Well, that would be the right place to talk about quad. That seems like a bit of an oversight. Okay, so let's pop it. Um, So actually, I guess we can do um, a, a function, an anonymous function without assignment. So that's a function and therefore we can apply it to something. And that's the same as first assigning it to F and then calling F on the thing. Um, okay. Assignments, okay, so we can go A equals three A, and then this is the same thing, but with printing, and we can assign a list. Out of curiosity, is the, the box still hold the value three? I guess I could check here. Um, it said that there was some special thing when you reference it. So no, it doesn't. Gotcha. It's not a normal variable. It's a weird special thing. Um, when you reference it, a prompt's displayed and input is requested. And then you can put things after it as well, like IO and stuff to change the way 
things work. All right. Um, so that means we can do, we've got a, um, oh, we've got a row of our matrix. We've got a row of A. We could do also things like um, row of three. And that's, uh, this is special. This is, um, this is a scalar. Um, I believe, although it's printing out, well, this is a scalar. Oh, no, this is not a scalar. This is just a, this is like the empty set. This is nothing at all, which I think there's a symbol for. But it might not count as a. As it's a, one of the last um, three, I think they call it Zilde. Just one moment. Uh, yeah, sorry, say it again. That it's one of the last three, Zilde or something. Zilde. Empty vector is a numeric constant. Okay. Let's see if that displays the same way. It is. Okay. And the so. shape of that is zero, I think. Um, how do you enter that? The to check the, the shape. How do you type how do you type a zero? I just pasted it. It's the back tick oh. right curly bracket. Okay, how did you find that as a matter of interest? Uh, it's the f kind of far right of your keyboard up at the top. Far right. Three from the right. Oh, well found. I see. MT numeric vector. Great. Um, it's, yeah, so interestingly, the rank of Zilde is not Zilde. It's actually an array containing zero. Um, and so this brings us to the song, which is that um, if I, so given that row of mat is two, three, that means row of row of mat is two, right? Because it's like, this is a list, a one dimensional array rank one array containing two elements. So this is row of two, three. And so row of that is one. And because row of Zilde is this, row of row of that is one, and row of row of row of that is one. And um, um, actually, let's go higher dimensional. Um, we can do bigger ones. We can say, give me uh, two faces, each with two rows, each with three columns. So this is like a kind of a rectangular prism, if you like. And that's how they display it. Um, Oh, a change somewhere along the lines. Um, let's run this again. Use A. And you'll see it's created two matrices that kind of, you can think of them as stacked on top of each other. So this is the rank three tensor. Um, and it's when it ran out of numbers from A, it just went back to the start. Um, <clears throat> so you can use row as repeat. So for example, if I use a scalar, it's just a matrix of ones. Um, so let's call this C for cube. Um, and so we can get... Uh, this is... Oh, 
on that matrix thing um yeah. does the thing on the margin of it mean anything to you like this one here you no know no like the one above it you know this one here yeah yeah, yeah. What so is this that? has got this has got two there's actually two dimensions happening here there's this dimension and there's this dimension so ideally if we had a 3d display they would be on top of each other you know but we don't so it just prints them with a space between and it puts two kind of dimension lines here to tell us this is actually representing two separate axes because this is two faces by two rows by three columns i see okay so each arrow is kind of a dimension in that exactly sense. exactly um yeah so we could do row of row of row of c and so row of row of row of anything ends up being one uh and so that gives us our first and possibly only apl song uh apl row row richard storman here we go Oh, there is actually a dialogue poetry section that's important. <laughs> um, and here's the one about row, which Claire and I have now learned by heart. Row, row, row of x always equals one. Row is dimension, row, row, rank. APL is fun. So yeah, row, row, row of anything gives us one. Row of something is the dimension. So Row, so um, tells us how many rows by columns or whatever it's, we, I would call it a shape, they call it dimension. Row of row of something tells you the tensor rank. Um, so that's why that poem. One above it's pretty good too. <laughs> <laughs> nice. How oh, there you go, there's an MP3 recording of an APL song. So um, to wrap up, let's do IOTA, um, which is a nice, easy one. So IOTA is just the same as um, range, basically. So IOTA 4, um, it's the same as range, except it starts at 1 rather than 0 um, by default. You can change that. Um, I believe you can say. Uh, quad io zero or something like that to change like so it starts at zero instead of one um i kind of like just going to leave it in the default because otherwise it's just going to get confusing i think if you haven't found it yet one of the really cool things about iota is you can range in multiple dimensions so if you do iota 202 Yeah, so it's creating basically all of the coordinates um, to kind of index into a multi-dimensional structure, I guess. So here's it's, and so this is like the Cartesian product of the set of one, two with a set one, two, three. And so now we've got arrays and arrays. And so you can change, see the symbols changed. Um, so to create our matrix, an easier way to create the matrix would have been to just go two, three, uh, row of iota six. So iota six is one, two, three, four, five, six, and then two, three of that is the matrix. Um, all right, so let's, Oh, did I close that? Whoops. I had a question. Yeah. Um, with IOTA, like, you know how, like, in Python, we have, like, a start, stop, and step? Is there something yeah. similar with IOTA? No, it's not. But you don't really need it, right? Because, like, let's say I want to step by two. That's easy enough, you know. Uh, or if I want to start one more than that, that's easy enough. You know, um, 
So I think that's why, is we don't really need it. OK. Um, OK. Iota, Iota, Iota. Where is it? Here it is. OK. Monadic Iota means index generator. OK, so that's why it's called index generator, because these are, these are the indices of all of the locations in a two by three array. Iota. Monadic. Index generator. OK. And then dyadic. OK, and let's just check the help for index generators to see if we missed anything. OK, so r equals iota y. You pass it a scalar or a vector of non-negative numbers, and you get back a numeric array, the set of all possible coordinates, which is exactly what we thought. Um, Oh, so um, that's interesting. So I think one special thing is iota zero, which is another way of getting that builder thing. That's the empty set. OK, uh, so the dyadic version is index of. Um, and this won't make any sense really until we've got strings. So let's do strings first. Um, okay, so um, strings are basically vector arrays, sorry, character, Character vector characters and character vectors. So that's a character vector and that's a character. Um, and so now we should be able to understand their example. So I've noticed the examples when I click on like the name of like the dyadic version, for example, the examples tend to be more complicated than the one in the overall summary, just to warn you. Um, so I'm going to use the simpler ones. OK, so index of uh, takes this list, this sorry, this array, and tells you the index of each of these things. And so remember, this is a list of three letters. I believe. It's identical, is it? Let's see. Actually, it's tr um, here's, here's ACF, and here's a list containing A, C, and F. Yeah, they're the same thing. So that's interesting. Yeah. So, um, so that is a single character. This is a list of characters. And this is just a little syntactic shortcut for creating a list of characters. And lists of characters appear with no space between them when it outputs them. But they are still just lists of characters. Um, I believe if you put a character on the right hand side that's not in the left, like a Z, it will give you one more than the total length. Oh, good. Let's add so that, that 11 list. is there, but it's not actually in the list. Thanks. Got it. Um, so then an interesting example they have is if what, what if you've got a higher ranked matrix? So here they're saying, oh, let's assume we've already got a matrix with this in it, because they're assuming we don't know how to create one. And we might get confused. So now that we do, let's go ahead and create one. So I create a matrix, and they used uh, three rows of two columns. 
of iota 6. Um, uh, uh, over row. OK. Um, and so then they said, given that, what if we do this? Uh, now, what's that doing? Dex of the first occurrence of subarrays in Y which match major cells of X. Oh, okay, so this is an important concept. I don't know the difference between a subarray and a major cell yet, but the idea is okay, so Y is the thing on the right, X is the thing on the left. Okay, so here's Y. So it's going to try to find this, what do they call it? This, it's going to try to find this subarray in the major cells of X. So this, they're going to treat this as a row and try to find which row contains that in it. And the answer is row three. Does it work if you put one, three, five or something? Would Will it find it, I guess? Ah, here. so that doesn't work. I'm pretty sure it's not going to because that's not considered a major cell. Yeah. So the major cells of this are its rows. So if you wanted to do this, you'd have to transpose it first. And there is a transpose operator. Um, I know there's... So we should probably do a, like, I think something that's missing in the di in the dialog docs is the simplest possible versions of things. So let's just say, let's find the number three in the list one, three, six, five, four. Now why is, oh, wrong way around. In the list of this, find the number three. There we go. <sighs> okay. Are we done? I think so. I think we made good progress. I think so too. Thanks, gang. Are uh, vectors, lists, and arrays the same term in APL? No. An array is like a NumPy array. So an array can be um, any shape. So a vector is a rank one array. A matrix is a rank two array. A scalar is a rank zero array. I don't know what we call rank three arrays, but yeah. Um, it's the same as what PyTorch calls as tensor. Thank you. Although one difference is a PyTorch tensor can't contain tensors, but a, um, I think a NumPy array can contain arrays. So it's probably more like NumPy than PyTorch. All right. Thanks, everyone. That was cool. We all learned something, hopefully. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care, everybody. See ya.